so this does kind of take us then into uh, the next section of probably a little bit over my head, but I've, I've noticed for, for all of my clinical life, which is over 30 years now, that there are differences in men and women. See how sharp I am. But uh, specifically with respect to hazard rates for mood disorders and depression included. So before puberty, it's about the same as, as males. A uh, after menopause, it's about the same for males. But during uh, those hazard periods of reproductive years, women's risk for uh, multiplicity of, of illnesses is significantly higher uh, than, than a man. So, for example, women experience higher rates of depression than men, again, just during those years, and that's across cultures, right? That's consistent. From puberty through reproductive years, women have a roughly twofold higher risk of major depression compared to men right, 21% versus about 13%. Women have higher rates of autoimmune diseases compared to men. Um, and that interesting, two to nine-fold greater risk for lupus, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis. Additionally, more women have clinically relevant elevations in CRP, an inflammatory marker indicating cardiovascular risk compared to men. I don't think we'll have time to get into it today unless it comes up in the question and answer period. But you know, CRP is emerging. It's not a great tool, but it's emerging perhaps as a predictor of whether you're gonna to respond to norepinephrine dominant treatment versus serotonin dominant treatment in depression, who knew? Furthermore, multiple factors that elevate MDD risk can also promote inflammation, suggesting overlapping, intersecting, bi-directional pathways. Next slide, please. All right. Here we go then, anxiety disorder and sex differences. Women have two times the risk of men for major depression. We talked about that, anxiety disorders, higher incidence of social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, specific phobia, post-traumatic stress disorder, and more frequent panic attacks. Now I'm assuming, but I don't know for sure, and Mary weigh in on this uh, uh, in a little bit, if you would, is that just do, during uh, that, that those years of reproductive life or is this across the board and then overall women have worse quality of life when suffering from anxiety disorders interesting so what again the question that comes to me is there something adaptive to the species for women during reproductive years to have increased inflammation curious all right and this is just to remind us that these pathways, these biopsychosocial risk factors for elevated inflammation, depressive symptomatology, uh, why, why is that? I mean, really, we need to think about um, why not only then is the threshold for immune reactivity set lower for women during their reproductive years, right? So it takes less to initiate an exuberant immunological dissonance. Um, but at the same time, and I guess at the same time, not only is that threshold lower, but once activated, then boom, off and running. And so it's a little bit worse and thereby the quality of life is uh, as a result, a little bit worse. Okay, so lower threshold and then a more exuberant reactivity for women during those childbearing years. And this just is basically uh, a way of saying, uh, bracketing all of this, that women have an enhanced risk for all risk factors, inflammation, depressive symptoms. And I suspect, although Mary, you're gonna talk about this uh, next section, I suspect it has got to do with uh, differences in, in estrogen and reproductive hormones, men versus women. This takes us to our next section. And I'm gonna hand this back off to you and answer some of my questions, darn it. Thanks, well, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dave. I, I think, you know, one thing you, you asked, you were talking about is, you know, is this more prevalent during the reproductive years? And it is. We, we know that boys and girls actually have the same rates of depression. Um, and, and obviously, adolescence is already a time where we have a lot of new onset of depression and anxiety. Um, and that's true for both boys and girls, which, you know, probably speaks to that period of transition. Um, but it is even higher for girls. Um, and I and for women and for females and and I think that that it is about women need you know females needing to be able to navigate these transitions for themselves as well as for the rest of their family and so 
we see actually that same kind of thing across the, the reproductive lifespan for women that you know that it really is these periods of transition where there are also these periods of increased depression so you know adolescence um, postpartum uh, perimenopausally and these are all major areas of transition where we all need to navigate those transitions and help everyone else navigate um, and so then let's think about you know the gut bacteria and it seems like well how is that rel you know how does that relate to that but I, I think it's really beautiful to think about because you know, the bacteria were actually, you know, they were here before us. And so we've really kind of, you know, developed along with the bacteria to have these ecosystems and these this balance between us and to really help one another. And, and actually the relationship between the gut bacteria and the microbiome and estrogen um, is a really interesting place to really focus on that. Um, and I think you know, that the, the bacteria are actually, they're trying to transit, they're trying to get through these transitions and they may actually even be driving some of our transitions, which is kind of interesting to think about. And so let's think about that in a little more detail with the next slide. So this is a really great um, review article by Baker et al. Um, and, and really gets at how, how might the bacteria be relating to, to the hormones that we are making. Um, and so particularly let's in this one focus a bit on estrogen. Um, and so the bacteria, many of the bacteria actually have the possibility to take our estrogen and actually to deconjugate it and make it a more active form. Um, and so the bacteria have have gained this ability um, in, in a, you know, in an ability to live within us and just for have us all kind of live within balance. And you think about during a time of transition, for example, the postpartum period, you know, during pregnancy, we have the highest level of estrogen and progesterone that we will have probably at any time in our life. And then with the delivery of the placenta, that drops very quickly. Um, and so that's a huge transition. Um, and so the, the bacteria actually have the ability to take some estrogen and actually kind of activate more of it. Um, and so that we have more active estrogen available, particularly, I think, probably even more important during these periods of transition. But then we think about this idea of dysbiosis. So we think about, you know, when we have, and the, the perfect example of dysbiosis is C. difficile, you know, so that, that's a bacteria that basically takes over your gut and that it takes over and becomes the main bacteria. Um, and so that's kind of an extreme, but I think, you know, in dysbiosis in general is this idea that we have less bacteria and less kind of evenness of our bacteria. So we kind of have a few bacteria that are really predominating and we have less overall different types of bacteria. And so with that, we end up having less of the bacteria that can, can do things such as deconjugate the estrogen. And that's where we start to see, um, and that, that leads to then um, you know, estrogen is so important to so many components. And, you know, we um, actually, why I went into women's health was um, the, the women's health initiative that found the connection between estrogen, you studied the connection between estrogen and the cardiovascular system. And so then we can see where these things have all these downstream effects. Um, and certainly, I think I increasingly am interested in that effect on mood and anxiety as well. Um, and then let's look at the next slide, which looks at a little more detail. Uh, from a, another really great review article by Newman. Um, and this one actually just highlights, I think, how, m how many different neurotransmitters and hormones that our bacteria are important for and how these systems ultimately are very interrelated. Um, so um, actually antibiotics actually, you know, decrease, um, may decrease our bacteria and actually we find less estrogen levels with antibiotics, which is really interesting to think about. The, um, we've also found that the bacteria um, both actually create certain, um, certain neurotransmitters, for example. Um, serotonin is an example of that. We actually have more serotonin in our gut than anywhere else, um, and that it helps not only kind of direct the tryptophan, which we get in our diet, direct us to create serotonin, but also uh, stores of serotonin and, and helps kind of create as well as modify and increase serotonin. Um, so there are a number of these uh, neurotransmitters as well as hormones that are important. But I think also when we look at the, the top part of that, that it's important as we were already talking about, that there are all these other components 
that are going into that and that this is really this ecosystem and this balance that needs to occur you know it's that we you know that our diet and and our health state and our exercise and our activities that those and our stress levels that all those pieces are how we are interacting with our world and the the bacteria are also trying to interact with our internal you know gut world but also with the outer world and so it's this kind of continued balancing of all of that. Um, and so this does a really nice job of, of really kind of, of thinking about that and how the bacteria um, really is impacting these different hormones and, um, and for example, um, serotonin. Um, and I think, which is an interesting one to think about because, um, you know, we think a lot about serotonin in, in mood and anxiety because our one of our major treatments for it are selected uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. Um, and, and as we increasingly understand, we have actually found that those kinds of medicines actually seem to associate with changes in our gut bacteria. And so there clearly is this back and forth between those, uh, those systems. Um, and those um, are then important to all these other components in the development, for example, of anxiety and stress and, and depression. And that really brings us back to kind of this, again, thinking about this in this larger system. That was beautiful. It raises so many, so many questions. Uh, do you know if there's any data before I present this last one, uh, Mary? I'm not going to let you get a break in here, unfortunately. But uh, so, you know, we, we know that reproductive life event related mood and anxiety symptoms in women, uh, you know, we usually treat those with a serotonin dominant reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, for example, SNRI. Do we know if, if those, uh, it, during those times, a woman has uh, decreased gut microbial diversity? In other words, I, I guess we don't, uh, that don't, you don't have to answer that. If you know it, great. If not, it's just kind of one of those I guess rhetorical questions, but let me do my job, present this, you think about that, and we'll get to some uh, discussion here after that. But the story then that we have tried to tell really goes back to uh, changes in the environment or bringing about this state of chronic smoldering system-wide metaflammation, inflammation that involves the gut. Uh, and we think that's responsible for many of our diseases of civilization via multiple inputs, right, imbalances, uh, across uh, many physiological systems, neurotransmitters, adrenal output, HPA axis activity, immune reactivity, reproductive hormones, other hormones. And so today we have focused the talk by talking really just about two main players, and, and that is only one of those diseases of civilization or one set of them, the mood disorders, and then really only one of those psychoneuroimmunological perturbations, that being reproductive hormones. Uh, but hopefully we have conveyed to you, it's a lot more complicated than that. And while it's important to I think increase our uh, understanding uh, of of each of the players, boy, it's it's really hard to grapple with with all that is going on. And that's why psychiatry is so fun, and but at the same time so difficult, uh, so complex, and and really probably defies some of our best efforts some days. So I really don't have much more to say in terms of some summary. Uh, I'm hoping we have some time, Laura, for either further discussion or maybe even some questions. 